Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the NEB podcast. I'm your host, Lydia Morrison, and I hope that today's podcast broadens your perspective. I'm joined by Scott Chimileski, who's currently a postdoctoral fellow in Roberto Coulter's lab at Harvard Medical School, and he's also co-curator of Microbial Life, a universe at the edge of sight, currently on exhibit at the Harvard Museum of Natural History. Today, Scott's here to talk about the intersection of art and science and the important role that mentors play in the realm of science careers. Thanks so much for joining me today, Scott. Thanks for inviting me. So how did you get involved in microbial art in the first place? So during the, I would say towards the end of my PhD at the University of Connecticut, I started to study biofilms, which are like a multicellular-like form of of bacteria. I was actually working with archaea at the time, some salt-loving archaea. And I had already been a photographer for a long time before that, just taking photographs of nature and landscapes and wildlife. And it was around that time when I started working on biofilms, which are very imaging intensive field of study in microbiology. For example, at the Center for Biofilm Engineering in Montana, and I was learning how to do confocal microscopy of these biofilms. And I guess it was around then that I started realizing how beautiful these biofilm structures were. And it was also around then that I started photographing colonies of archaea and bacteria in the lab. And so that's when the photography side of me, if they're different sides to begin with, and the scientist track sort of began to merge. And that's that's really how it got started. Why do you feel like um, microbes lend themselves so well to making art? One of the things I was noticing around that period was that these bacteria that I would cultivate or, or that we had in the lab represented, for example, the whole palette of colors that you could find on an artist's palette. There's bacteria just outside this door right now in the soil where when you grow them up in the lab, they'll be bright orange, bright purple, red, pink, blue. I mean, every color in the rainbow. And so right away, you have all of those beautiful natural colors. And then as it comes back to biofilms, you also see these remarkable patterns and structures in biofilms. And they have like a fractal pattern, almost the types of patterns that you see all over the place in nature. So patterns really do repeat themselves in nature. And you can see these beautiful fractal patterns in biofilms, for example, that look superficially similar to maybe how the Earth looks from space sometimes, different patterns in rivers, how rivers join each other and rejoin each other. So you see these sorts of patterns that I, that I could find in the bacterial colonies. That's interesting. And so they also seem to lend themselves really well to time-lapse photography in particular. Can you talk a little bit about how you decided to apply time-lapse photography to capturing these images? Yeah, so the still version of like a photograph of a colony or something like that is only going to tell such a small part of the story because in bacteria, when you build a biofilm, this is really like a type of a developmental program. So it's obviously, it's a lot less complicated than how an embryo would develop or something like that for an animal. Mm -hmm. Um, But the basic principles are there and it it is a true developmental program where you start from a single bacterium, that bacterium grows and divides, and over time you get interactions between the cells, and it's those interactions that lead to the the final biofilm structure. So it's really important, I think, to capture that whole process from a single cell sometimes all the way up to the finished biofilm. As far as how I first started doing time-lapse of microbes, is again related to my background in photography. So I was doing a lot of time lapse of nature, just clouds rolling by on landscapes and things like that. And so I had already learned how to do time lapse. I had what's called an intervalometer that you hook up to your SLR that tells it how often to take photos and things like that. And when I was uh, in the last year of my PhD studying these biofilms formed by archaea, I noticed that my biofilms on my bench from one day to the next had different shapes. Mm -hmm. So I was like looking at them every day and I was thinking, what's, you know, what's going on here? These biofilms seem to be doing something while I'm not around. (laughs) And so it just sort of hit me, okay, well, I just need to make a time lapse and see what's happening here. So that was when I built my first dedicated time lapse system inside of an incubator. And that was probably in 2013. That, I guess, was the first version of my time-lapse incubator. And ever since then, I've just been updating and modifying that initial 
design. And I was able to discover, in that case, a new type of a social motility in this archaeon that I was studying. The species is called Halopharyx volcanii. And I found that the biofilms were moving in a collective fashion. And that's what I was noticing on the bench. And I was able to capture that through time lapse. And we wrote a paper about that. That's cool. So it really gave you sort of a new window into viewing the movement and the changes of the biofilms to be able to really catalog those movements, I guess. Yeah, so it's, in my mind at least, equal parts to capturing the beauty of what's happening and then the beauty of the structures and the intricacy there and also documenting it for scientific purposes. Cool. So let's talk about your mentor, Roberto Coulter. It seems like the two of you have a pretty unique relationship. Do you have any advice that you could share for graduate students or postdocs who are deciding which lab to join or tips for what to look for in a mentor? The first advice that I would give is actually advice that came to me from Roberto as I was seeking out his lab for a postdoc, and that is to start early. So Roberto's advice to me at the time was like 18 months. So if you're a grad student or a PhD student finishing up, 18 months is not too early to start seeking out you know, your postdoc lab and making contacts to that person. So that is around the time that I started contacting Roberto. And you're right that we do have a special relationship. And I think that that really also comes out of us having a lot of time to plan these projects because I was joining his lab as a postdoc and doing research and as an imaging specialist in the lab. But we were also, from those early days, planning to write a book together already and planning to make these museum exhibitions. Those projects were really part of it from day one. And of course, like if we hadn't started planning those things way back, even before I joined the lab, then they w could have never come to fruition. And then as far as finding a good match, in my own experience, I had been reading papers from Roberto for a long time. And not just, I mean, they were all scientific papers, but I could also see the streak of creativity in the papers. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, like I said, I was studying biofilms as a PhD student. And he has this one paper that's something that's titled something like Thieves and Assassins of the Microbial World or something like that. And, and, you know, there's a lot of examples like that if you look through his papers. And so I thought, you know, he's really a creative person and somebody who not just creative, but somebody who values creativity and who really looks for that connection between art and science. I also knew at that time that he was the cover editor for the Journal of Bacteriology. So he's the person who picks the cover every month for that. And so I definitely knew ahead of time that he was going to be receptive towards the, these types of projects. And that you know made all the difference versus um, just going to somebody randomly and then saying, hey, you know, let's write a book or make a museum exhibition. So lots of uh, research up front and time in thinking and planning about what you want to get out of your postdoc or your graduate school experience. I've been certainly impressed to learn all that you've accomplished in your three years at your postdoc, right? You've had two museum exhibitions and a book, among other things, and having your photography displayed. And it's like 30 different places that have, that have used your photography, everything from like CBS to scientific journals. So that's pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that either of us thought that it was going to go exactly how it did as far as how well it went. One thing that we were really pleased with was the timing of the book and the exhibition. So they were always parallel projects, but you know, we probably assumed that they wouldn't come out at the same time. And then they ended up coming out you know, within days of each other. The, the museum exhibit opened and the book launched, which made it really fun because we took the book to the museum and took photos there with the book, and we were super excited. And that was about a year ago now when the book and the first exhibit opened. So yeah, I mean, I think that luck Certainly, you know, a hard work. And we wrote the book pretty quickly, but also luck comes into it as well. And um, yeah, we've been really happy with it. And a good deal of planning, it seems like. <laughs> yeah, a good deal of planning, for sure. So your latest publication with Roberto was entitled The End of Microbiology. What does that mean? <laughs> so I'm glad, I'm really glad you asked about that, <laughs> because um, as you might guess, with such a controversial title, it's something that I'm really happy to talk about. So the title, The End of Microbiology, was meant to be provocative, but 
Really the paper is all about how we make divisions between different disciplines as scientists. And so the end of microbiology was a piece that we were asked to write, which was a vision piece. So we were specifically asked to write by the Environmental Microbiology Journal, you know, what's going to happen 20 years from now in microbiology. Mm. And what we see happening and what we hope will continue to happen is sort of a breakdown of these barriers between disciplines, which in my view, these are really false divisions. Between divisions within science or between divisions within like art and science and sort of a broader thinking yeah, about cer- subjects? Yeah, certainly art and science as well. But I mean, right now, I mean, just between different scientific disciplines. So, for example, microbiology. So microbiology came about as a separate discipline really because a few hundred years ago we invented a microscope. Mm. And so then we all of a sudden start using a microscope and we say, okay, everything that we see through the microscope is a microbe. And so these, this is now microbiology. Mm. But meanwhile, those organisms were there all along, way before we had the microscope from the beginning of life itself And so we kind of put up these artificial boundaries around different disciplines. Mm -hmm. But now, because of the the microbiome fields in particular, we're seeing how intimately connected microbes are to macroscopic life. Mm -hmm. So there really is like no true division. And this is something that we talk about in the book, too. In fact, the title of the book, Life at the Edge of Sight, kind of deals with this idea of the edge of sight and how humans based on our visual acuity, define what a microbe is and what is not a microbe. Meanwhile, there might be another organism that has a different visibility, a different vision system that might have, you know, might be able to see what we call microbes. And so that's one way of realizing that it's sort of a false boundary that's really relative to only humans. And so the paper really just argues for the fact that microbiology and all disciplines of biology are really just all biology, that nature is indivisible and that in certain cases you might have an advantage to setting microbiology apart and studying it in its in its own right but i think that in most cases you're putting yourself at a disadvantage if you say okay i'm a microbiologist so i only study these bacteria meanwhile those bacteria are in your body and they're so relevant to how your body functions and to how the whole biosphere itself functions that I think that you're putting yourself at a disadvantage if you sort of wall yourself off and say, I'm only going to study microbes. So it's really just a, a sort of call to arms and a plea that we start to break down some of these divisions and look at biology as a whole. An interesting concept. So you were a 2016 Passion in Science winner, and we're about to launch the application process for our 2018 awards. How has being a Passion in Science award winner impacted your career? So I would say it comes back to, like you mentioned that my photography has been used in a lot of different outlets and has gotten all over the place. And I think that there was a certain momentum there that happened. You know, I started my postdoc in 2015 and then this award came about a year into my postdoc. That's also when we were working on the book and a lot of the, the exhibit intensively, but I think it really did help me to gain momentum. And then, you know, I can't say for sure how much that momentum mattered, but I think it mattered a lot as far as pushing me forward into all of these other opportunities that have happened since then. Mm -hmm. So I would say it definitely uh, gave me a lot of exposure and just added to that momentum that takes me to today. It's always nice to be recognized for doing things that you excel at and things that you enjoy, too. So that probably just sort of helped be like, oh, people are interested in this. The exhibit's going to work. The book's going to work. Exactly. Yeah. So so the momentum, adding to the momentum is both in terms of exposure externally and also adding to my own confidence. And, you know, that further cycles into the positive feedback loop of pushing that work out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And certainly you've done a lot of work in terms of science communication. And to that end, you're currently a guest co-curator with Roberto of the microbial exhibit at the Harvard Museum of Natural History, which I have visited both of your exhibits there, and they were very engaging and educational in completely different ways. Could you tell our listeners a little bit about those exhibits? Yeah. So the museum project started, in my mind, in 2013 when I visited the Harvard Museum of Natural History and I love this museum it's a really historic museum 
but like so many natural history museums, there was very little emphasis on, on bacteria or microbes there. I went there one day and I searched the whole place and I found this one room called the New England Forest. And within the New England Forest, there was a rotting wood exhibit. And then on there, there was a tiny little cartoon of bacteria. <laughs> and so that just like, I literally was freaking out at, on that day at the museum <laughs> and, you know, like texting my family. And that time I knew I was going to start the postdoc and things were lining up. So I was like, this is what we're going to do. This is a big problem. We have to fix this. You know, of course, I didn't expect it to actually come to fruition. That was the moment that really started to catalyze it. And so after that, Berto and I met with the director of the museum, and we sort of pitched the idea to her. And she, her name is Jane Pickering, is a, is a great director of that museum, and she loved the idea from that moment forward from when she approved it. We were sort of off to the races. The museum ended up breaking it apart into two different exhibits. One was a teaser exhibition, which was more poetic and photographic. And that was up for six months. That was called World in a Drop, Photographic Explorations of Microbial Life. That photography exhibit is currently traveling to the Eden Project in the UK and also to a place in Colombia. So that's done pretty well. But then at the Harvard Museum, that came down and made way for the Microbial Life exhibit, which opened this past February, and that will be open until September of 2019. So they ended up breaking it up into those two different exhibits. And yeah, the idea is that the natural history of this planet is mostly microbial. So even though we're biased, like I've been saying in other answers, by, by our vision, as far as what we think makes up the biodiversity of the planet, most biodiversity of the planet is microbial. And so at a natural history museum, we really have to have a strong emphasis on microbes. Well, thank you from the general public for adding to the natural history museum and sort of opening everybody's eyes to the invisible. So can you tell our listeners what kombucha is? Yeah, so kombucha is part of our exhibit at the Harvard Museum. It's actually part of our live demo where we have some microbial scientists there with kombucha that they show to the visitors. And this is a type of microbial food, we would call it. It's a, a tea product that's made by microbes. So typically when you buy kombucha in the store and it's become a multi-billion dollar industry, all different types of brands, you see just, you know, just the tea part of it. But how kombucha is made is by starting off with a very sweet tea with a lot of sugar. And then you add some microbes to that sweet tea in the form of what's called a SCOBY which stands for Symbiotic Community of Bacteria and Yeast. And that's basically a biofilm that sits on top of the fermenting tea and develops there. And the microbes that live inside of that biofilm are fermenting the tea. And as they do so, they're adding different flavors to the tea. It's truly a product that relies upon microbes. So when someone picks up a bottle of kombucha at the grocery store and drinks it, are they ingesting microbes? Yeah, they're definitely ingesting microbes, just like beer or how yeast makes bread, things like that. The SCOBY biofilm that I just described, that part of it is removed from you know any kind of commercial kombucha. You would really only see that biofilm if you made your own kombucha, which a lot of people do make their own kombucha. The one that we have in the museum is homemade kombucha. Otherwise, you would never see all those microbes at the top. However, if you look closely, there's usually in any kombucha still some sort of fine material that settles Sediment. at the bottom. So there's definitely some microbes in there that you're drinking. And are those microbes part of what's beneficial about the beverage? Yeah, so this is a question that we get very often at the museum. And I have to give a kind of boring answer, which is that we really don't know if kombucha is beneficial or not. It's one of many products that contain probiotic bacteria that have a lot of claims behind them, mm -hmm. but we really don't know. Like, There's not a lot of studies that show their beneficial effects, so it's kind of an early field, the microbiome field in general, and it's kind of early to say whether or not kombucha is beneficial. The other thing is that because, for example, you and I have different microbiomes in, in our gut, you and I have some different microbes the microbiome varies in general from person to person. That means that we can drink the same kombucha and it might affect your gut community in a way that it doesn't affect mine or vice mm. versa. So it's, it's just a very complicated field that we're just sort of getting a foothold in. And that's why when people ask about these probiotic products, we have to kind of 
take a step back and say, we really don't know right now if Mm. it's beneficial or not. So recently a friend told me that she drank a kombucha that she picked up at the grocery store and she felt like she'd had a glass of wine or two. Does that happen frequently? Is that like over fermented? What's the explanation of that? Yeah, so the explanation of that is definitely a microbial explanation. And that is because what you have happening as this biofilm forms in kombucha, you have what's known as an ecological succession that happens. And so it's really neat if you think about the biofilm almost like a microbial forest. You can think about this ecological succession almost like a forest that's burned down. And then you know when a forest burns down, there's a certain order to how the saplings and the grasses come back and and recolonize. So the same thing happens in the sense that you have an order of the different microbes that form that biofilm. And so the yeasts are the ones that come in first, Mm -hmm. and they're growing off of the sugar in that sweet tea, and they're producing alcohol. And so that's where the alcohol is coming from. Then you have acetic acid bacteria that come in and they are feeding off of the products of the earlier microbes, and they're producing acetic acid, which is you know vinegar, so then it gets to be vinegary. Mm-hmm. So it really does depend on the different kombucha, and particularly if you're making homemade kombucha, you can get all sorts of different flavors. You could get some that are more alcoholic than others, some that are more vinegary than others, depending on the scoby that you started it with and depending on how long you let it ferment, et cetera. Well, that's interesting. I don't ever see on the kombucha in the grocery stores, I don't see like 1.2% alcohol. Are they not reporting on that or is it just like not that well controlled? Yet? Yeah, it should be one of those products that has, you know, some small percentage of alcohol, but mm-hmm. not really enough to intoxicate you. Mm. But, you know, certainly if, if you're making your own kombucha and something goes, goes haywire, then you could have more alcohol in there than in most products. Interesting. Thanks so much for joining us today, Scott. Thanks. It's always a pleasure to be at NAB. And I just want to remind our listeners that if you have the opportunity, you should go see Scott's exhibit at the Harvard Museum of Natural History. It'll be there through September of 2019. You can also follow Scott on Twitter and Instagram at Social Microbes. And if you want to check out some of his amazing photography and learn a little bit more about him, then check out the website microbephotography.com. I hope you enjoyed this episode of our podcast. Be sure to check out the transcript of the podcast for links to additional information. This is also a great time to mention that we're currently accepting applications for the 2019 Passion in Science Awards. So be sure to nominate yourself or someone you know who's passionate about their work in science. You can find more information about the awards as well as how to apply at nebpassioninscience.com.